thanks for showing up for uh, what I hope will be an interesting discussion about a seminal event that took place in Mississippi 50 years ago, and that was Freedom Summer. Um, we've got three excellent people who can talk about it and its impact. And I'll briefly introduce them and we'll just get started. I hope we'll have a little bit of time to entertain some questions from you all if you have any. But uh, working from my left, Roy DeBerry, who's involved today with the Hill Country Project, uh, interviewing people who uh, uh, have been involved with the movement and with uh, uh, integration in Mississippi, and then Susan Glisson, who's the executive director of the William Winter Institute for Racial Reconciliation, um, and uh, also from Ole Miss, uh, Dr. Charles Ross, who is a history professor and uh, also a director of African American Studies here. So thank you all for coming to the Overby Center and being with us. And let me just start off with uh, uh, I've got one contemporary here, uh, Roy DeBerry is, uh, he actually he's younger than I am, but uh, he too was around at the time of Freedom Summer and actually experienced uh, much of it firsthand. Uh, Roy, could you just kind of talk to us, kind of establish a climate? You were in Knowledge Springs uh, yeah, yeah, as a young you. man. Thank you. And I'm also pleased to be with you, and I'm also pleased to see a lot of young people here because one of the things that was so important about the movement uh, in general, and, and Freedom Summer in particular, was the fact that they had a lot of young people involved in that movement. And matter of fact, that, that was one of the things I think that made it somewhat unique. Holly Springs is a home for me. And of course, uh, my, my grandparents on my mother's side and my grandfather uh, actually came from Lafayette County. And my grandfather didn't care very much about Lafayette County. Uh, so he and my grandmother left in 1921 or so when my mother was a, was a small child. And they went to Holly Springs because at that time for them, Holly Springs had more opportunities for people of color. You had Russ College there. Uh, you had Mississippi Industrial College there. And it was a larger black community. Unlike now, what you see Oxford being somewhat larger than Holly Springs in terms of population. At the time, Holly Springs was perhaps larger than Oxford, except for the fact that you had the university here. Uh, in terms of the students who wanted to come to Holly Springs to drink some whiskey and get beer, they came to Marshall County because Marshall County was a, a wet county at uh, that the time. The Hubba Grill, I remember right, it right. well. And, 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 high, and uh, Lafayette County slash Oxford was supposedly dry, although I witnessed quite a few wrecks along Highway 7 after people had had too much to drink, even as a, as a child. So in terms of background, um, we talked about, we're talking about apartheid in a real sense. We're talking about Jim Crow either as a young child. Uh, we were talking about uh, terror, intimidation, bombing, violence. You know, that was the context that, that set the stage for 64. And of course, uh, as early as 1962, I was aware of the Freedom Rides, but before then, I was aware of what had happened in 1955, and everybody knows by now because everybody talks about it, the lynching of Emmett Till. Uh, and of course, uh, even as a young boy, uh, being told by my teacher that a young 14-year-old had been killed uh, and then nothing, uh, no justice done at all, you know, kind of struck me as, as uh, not, not very good at that, even at that young age. Uh, and then of course, 57, we, I think we got our first TV in 56. So I had a chance to watch the, the, uh, the integration of the uh, school system in Little Rock in 1957. And of course, I mentioned the Freedom Rides. And then of course, in 1962, um, Jane Meredith uh, made his entry into the University of Mississippi, uh, known as Ole Miss. And of course, the experience for me was watching uh, from Mississippi Industrial College sidewalk in 1962 and watching the troops uh, march through Harlem Springs. I had never seen so many troops in my life. My, my grandfather on my father's side had been involved in the war in France and had been killed in France. My father had been called up but didn't serve because uh, it was a later on and the war almost came to an end at that point so he didn't get drafted. But I had never seen that many troops before. And so we stood out for hours and watched the troops uh, come uh, through Harlem Springs on the way, on the way to, uh, 
to Oxford. So that's 1962. 1963 or so, we had a fellow named Frank Smith, who had been uh, a student at Russ College, was one of the first uh, to start to organize uh, in Mississippi and Holly Springs. So contrary to some of that historical stuff that you may have read about the outsiders always contributing to the movement, here was a local boy uh, from the Holly Springs area who had gone to Russ College, was organizing, trying to get people to register to vote uh, as a context. And keep in mind, one of the reasons why we end up with uh, 64 summer, uh, and I'm, I'm a high school student at this point, and at that point in time, COFO, uh, Council of Federated Ar uh, Organization, had, had set up a, a headquarters in Holly Springs. I think there was one in Macomb, there was one in Greenwood, uh, there was, of course there was one in Jackson, and then of course there was one in Holly Springs. So we would, uh, after class, we would leave and go over to the COFO house to hang out more or less, and to meet people. And I'd never seen so many books in my life, because so it made a point of bringing books in, so we had an opportunity to read extra that we didn't necessarily read in our own schools, because the schools were segregated. And certainly, although I consider myself a pretty decent student, we just didn't have the resources that they had at the predominantly white school. We knew that, although in 1954, they had built us a brand new uh, building that they called Rosenwald, and it said, well, you know, separate but equal, so you got this beautiful building down here, there's no need to even think about integration because you got a much better school than the whites. Of course, that was not true at all. It was just a physical plant, but when you looked inside that physical plant, and we knew what kind of facilities the white kids had because some of the people worked as janitors over there, and they told us about it. Um, so that's six to four, we're getting set up for the summer, uh, and this summer is this notion of, of, of SNCC having conferences and making a decision about what to do about the fact that they cannot break the system. Uh, they're still having difficulty registering people to vote. People are very fearful of, of registering to vote because you could be killed, you could be beaten, uh, you could lose your job, uh, you could be kicked out of your home for even attempting to register to vote. Uh, and if you went down to the courthouse uh, to deal with the clerk, uh, then people had to interpret the Mississippi Constitution to the satisfaction of the clerk, and oftentimes the clerk couldn't read herself or himself. And so therefore, uh, all you had to do was ask questions like how many bubbles in a bar of soap, all kinds of crazy stuff that made it difficult for people uh, to pass uh, the, the literacy test in order to register to vote. So at some point during that summer, I think there was some frustration with the way uh, the voter registration thing was going, and they decided to, say, have a movement that would call in students from all over the country, particularly students from the north. And Part of the thinking behind this it seemed to be a little cynical at the, at the time, perhaps even now, because I, I heard some of those discussions, was that we cannot seem to get in the movement here. Uh, blacks have been killed, blacks have been beaten, churches have been burned, uh, churches have been bombed, and so perhaps if we bring in uh, students and some white students, uh, perhaps that may be a way to you know, kind of crack the system a little bit. Now, nobody anticipated the fact that three workers, including two uh, from New York, along with Jane Cheney, would be killed, but they, they, they kind of knew that given the environment at that time, that that could happen, and as we know, it happened. And, and of course, after that happened, we know things started to, started to change. Now, so during that summer, we had a focus on voter registration, voter education, which I was involved in, canvassing, and my job was because I knew the lay of the land, I knew Holly Springs, I knew Marshall County, and these workers didn't know anything about Holly Springs, they didn't know anything about Marshall County, so they depended on me and a few other my age to kind of show them uh, places to go. And we oftentimes went to the homes of teachers, and we pretty much knew that the teachers were not going to go downtown to register to vote because they had too much to lose. But we went anyway. I think even after months of canvassing, we may have gotten three or four people to actually go and attempt to register to vote. So the, the voter registration thing was, a, was, a, was a, a key thing. The other key thing about that summer, let me know when, I, when I'm running too long, is the Freedom School. Now they had a Freedom School in Holly Springs. I did not attend this Freedom, Freedom School specifically, but what I did was we had a program set up in Benton County, and a lady named Viva Victorian and Frank Sioka uh, taught the classes, and I, along with five other students who were at that time thinking about going to college, went to this class two or three times a week, and we read novels. Um, for the first time, I had read, had not read Invisible Man, read Invisible Man, read stuff I write. Uh, so I had a chance to read uh, material that I had not read before. And in addition to reading those materials, we were also asked to question and to raise questions about what we read, make comments about what we read, uh, even uh, take on uh, questions about who 
runs this town? Who runs this state? Who runs this country? So we, we were being taught to do analysis. Uh, and at the same time, we also encountered people who later became very famous. We didn't know they were famous at that time. Stokely Carmichael was around. Uh, Cleve Sellers was around. He's now a president of a college. You know Stokely Carmichael went on to become SNCC chairman and a Black Panther leader and then went to Africa. Bob Moses, of course. Everybody knows about Bob Moses. Uh, I was telling uh, Curtis earlier a fellow named um, Dave Kendall, who, was a, who worked in Hollis Springs. He was a Rhodes Scholar, had gone to Yale, and, and ended up being Bill Clinton's chief uh, lawyer. Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer I met later because after we, the summer was over and they organized the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, I ended up in, the, in Atlantic City, not as a delegate, but as a young participant, and I had a chance to sleep on the boardwalk because we were not a delegate, so we could not get inside to see what LBJ and Humphrey was doing. Yeah. But we did get a chance to see Fannie Lou Hamer come out to the boardwalk and, you know, kind of keep our spirits up, um, sing those great songs that she could sing, and every once in a while said she's sick and tired of being sick and tired. Um, and Aaron Henry was there. At the end of the day, what they did was they rejected the compromise because, as you know, and maybe you don't know, there was the old Democratic Party that was Lily White, and then there was a Freedom Democratic Party that was biracial, and there was an attempt to unseat the, uh, the, the regular Democratic Party of Mississippi. But Lyndon Johnson, uh, at that point, was very concerned about his election, of course, and therefore was not going to hear uh, this idea of, of, of this delegation, even though it was perhaps the right delegation, being seated and uh, unseating the Little White Mississippi delegation. So they ended up with a compromise. They agreed on giving, and they announced that to us, two seats. And I think some of the delegates were inclined to go along with it, according to people that gave us information out on the boardwalk. But Ms. Hamer, who had spoken before the Credential Committee and later was on TV, said, no way. We're not going to accept this compromise. We'll go back to Mississippi, and we'll continue to organize. Anyway. Well, that was kind of a, a, a grand climax to the summer, I think, right. uh, uh, the events at Atlantic City. And I'm going to get back to that, but let me uh, progress here uh, and ask Susan Glisson about events in Neshoba County. I hope some of you know some of the background, but as Roy said, uh, there were several hundred students who came down here from uh, uh, schools from outside the South, and uh, uh, some of them came to Meridian and uh, they joined forces with, uh, they're called local people, young man named James Cheney. There were two white guys, uh, Andrew Goodman and uh, Michael Schwerner. And they went to uh, uh, Neshoba County next door to uh, check out a church that had been burned, uh, a black church that had voter registration uh, projects there that had been burned and uh, they knew that they were arrested by authorities. That was the last that was ever seen of them. Um, and uh, that was, uh, in, in many ways, the most horrific period, I think, uh, in Mississippi during the entire civil rights movement, that uh, these three young men had disappeared and, and everybody knew they were dead. And their bodies were finally discovered uh, in early August of 64, uh, buried uh, 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 outside of Philadelphia, Mississippi. There were 21 people who were uh, eventually charged in the case by the federal government. The state would not prosecute anyone. So uh, the federal government uh, charged these people and a few convictions were uh, obtained, uh, including uh, the deputy sheriff Cecil Price, uh, indicted had been the sheriff, Lawrence Rainey. Uh, there were a few others who actually served some time. S Sam Bowers, who was the imperial wizard of the White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, but there were a number of people who, uh, who escaped conviction. And over the years, there grew up a movement uh, in the Shelba County to try to bring some of these people to justice and Susan Glisson lent her good offices to that and I hope you would uh, 
although you weren't there for uh, all the excitement in 64. Tell us, I tell us about it. I was not yet born in 64. No. <laughs> I was just a baby, too, by the way. <laughs> um, I, was, I, I came along pretty quickly. Um, in, in 2004, um, uh, a community leader um, who had gone on to become a state leader, Secretary of State, uh, actually did office from Neshoba County, um, called, he was on our board. He said there are community leaders uh, in Philadelphia who um, are, are concerned. They know that this 40th anniversary of the civil rights workers' murders is coming up. They know the media is gonna come um, and uh, probably say that not much has changed in the community. Um, and they, they wanna tell a, a more nuanced story that, that, that some things have changed. Um, and they also want to use those conversations as a catalyst to try to, to, to make their community um, much, much stronger and much better than it is right now. Um, and would you be supportive of them? And I, I must tell you, I'm from Georgia, and I, 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 have never been, I had never been to Neshoba County. I was terrified to go there. All I knew about it was the movie, Mississippi Burning, and, and the civil rights books that I had read. Um, so uh, I, I gathered up my courage and um, said, sure, I'll go. Um, and, and what I discovered there is that there were some pretty phenomenal community leaders, black, white, and Choctaw, um, because the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians is there. Um, and in particular, there were two, two men um, who had actually gone to school together, black and white, and that was important. They had a, they had a relationship. They had um, gone to school together, and they had worked together um, at the newspaper as interns with Stanley Dearman, um, who was one of those voices of conscience uh, in the community. Um, and so they both uh, had sort of um, gone on to college and created their lives. And around about um, uh, 2003, Leroy Clemens was elected chair of the Neshoba uh, County NAACP and on the platform of doing something about the case. And Jim Prince, um, who had left town, moved back to town and bought the local newspaper, the Neshoba Democrat. And they literally ran into each other at the courthouse uh, in the fall of 2003 and said, you know, the anniversary is coming. We should do something. Um, I, I'll try to, it, it's, a, it's a long, complicated story, but the, the gist is that, that as the community leaders began to come together to talk about what they would do, um, it became obvious that there was not a sense of trust uh, among them. Um, in the very first meeting, um, we started to sort of talk about what, what could be done. We talked about what, what the university had done at the 40th anniversary of its desegregation as, a, as one example of what could be done. And I remember that an African-American gentleman um, said, well, why don't we have a march? And, you know, we're all polite uh, here in the South, and we often don't say when somebody says something that upsets us, but you could just tell, right? The white people got sort of paler, um, but nobody said anything, right? And so we just sort of kept talking. Um, and, then a, and then a white gentleman said, well, I know, let's have, let's have a resolution. Well, I could see black folks roll their eyes, <laughs> right? But we're polite, so nobody, nobody said anything. And, and basically, the meeting was a kind of a bust, except that everybody agreed to come back together to talk more. So everybody left except these two guys who knew each other, who had a relationship, who could trust each other enough to sort of say, <laughs> you know, there seemed to be some tension in the room. And, and Leroy said, gosh, you know, what, there, what, was, what was wrong with having a march? And Jim said, you know, when white people hear march, they think Al Sharpton, they think Jesse Jackson, they get terrified about anything being made to look bad. And Leroy said, I had no idea that that's what a march meant to y'all. That's, that's not what it means to us. And Jim said, well, you know, while we're on the topic, what was the problem with a resolution? And we always said, well, you know, there have been far too many promises written down and made to black folks that have not been kept, that, that resolutions are not something we trust. Uh, and if you want to really know about what folks think about words on a page, ask our Choctaw friends what they think about treaties. And, and Jim said, I, I really had no idea. So it's clear that they're speaking the same language, but they don't mean the same things by the words. They don't know each other enough to ask those questions. And so they put aside making any plans. And for two months, every Monday night, um, everybody just got together in a room and they shared their stories, who they were, what they cared about in their community, 
their fears, their hopes. Um, and they learned some important things in that conversation. The, the black folks learned that there were, in fact, white folks who cared about what happened to those three young men, um, which was not something they'd ever heard before, and that white folks were also afraid of the Klan. Um, black folks, uh, white folks learned that black folks did not hold every white person accountable for what happened. Um, and that was freeing and liberating in some ways for, for those white folks to learn. And so through those conversations, they built trust, they built relationships, and it became obvious to them that what they needed to do was to call for justice in the case. And Stanley Dearman was drafted to write a beautiful proclamation that called on the state of Mississippi to bring these, these murderers to justice. Um, and so on the, on the 40th anniversary, the 21st of, of June, the, the coalition, as it became known, the Philadelphia Coalition, was joined by the governor and four congressmen and 1,500 people. And they read this resolution calling for justice. They didn't stop there, though. They also then met with the local DA to, to, to prod him to open the case. And we met with the attorney general, uh, Jim Hood. And we brought in um, Carolyn Goodman and David Goodman, who were the mother and brother of Andrew Goodman. And again, people just shared the stories of what this traumatic, horrific injustice had meant in their own lives. And it was in that meeting that Jim Hood promised the coalition and especially promised Carolyn Goodman that he would reopen the case. Um, I like to say on the day of Epiphany in the Christian calendar, uh, Edgar Ray Killen, who was the ringleader of the murders, um, was indicted by a, a local grand jury. So it, less than six months after the, this community call for justice, there was an indictment and then 41 years to the day of the murders. Uh, Edgar Ray Killen was convicted uh, of the murders and he will uh, go to his reward from Parchman Penitentiary. Yeah, yeah Preacher Killen is still in Parchman today in his 80s. He is, he is. And you know, it's important for the community to say, if all we ever do is put an 80-year-old man in prison, then we will have failed our community. That's, that's not enough. Uh, it's about educating our children to, so, so that we understand that we have to intentionally create environments where this kind of horrific thing doesn't happen again. And so as a result of uh, what I think for many of us was unexpected leadership from this particular community, it really inspired other communities to begin to look more carefully at their own uh, histories, uh, Macomb and Tallahassee County both began to talk about the things that had happened there. And um, on the momentum of that, um, that uh, conviction in 2005, we were able then to go into the legislature in 2006 and um, get a bill passed that mandated teaching civil rights and human rights history in Mississippi classrooms. <laughs> but because A, it was unfunded, which is always important when you're asking the legislature to do something good. Um, and B, it had uh, the, the momentum of this international um, um, coverage. So we were able to kind of uh, use that as an entering wedge to get, to get into the classrooms to try to teach kids about this important history. Thank you. Chuck Ross, you're the historian here. Uh, even though uh, I learned today you were born in 64. That's but right. Still, I would value your uh, observations on the historical <laughs> impact of Freedom Summer in, in the movement, in the state of Mississippi, and in our country. Well, I think Mr. DeBerry and, and uh, definitely Susan, they've all touched on, I don't know much more that I can add. I think that when I look, I think of Freedom Summer, I look at it from a couple of perspectives. I look at uh, first Emmett Till because the lynching of Emmett Till brought so-called outsiders to the state of Mississippi really for the first time, and they kind of began to uh, scrutinize and analyze the state and try to uh, evaluate what, what was going on. And of course, in 64, um, you have a significant number of individuals that come, uh, and they merge with um, uh, local people uh, that are already here, uh, TRM Howard and C.C. Bryant, and others that um, have been grinding away. Um, I think that um, when you look at what SNCC was trying to do, um, it really in many ways kind of revolutionized this state because the idea that you're gonna to try to get individuals uh, to register and vote, uh, we're gonna have these kind of mock elections, we're gonna have freedom schools. Uh, if you look at where we are as a state today, 
what took place in 64, it, basically that legacy uh, profoundly changed what we have today. Mississippi has more elected African Americans than any other state in the country. Uh, and, I, and I would look at what took place in 64, this ideology that you have a right to vote as a citizen is very, very revolutionary. And that was the fundamental component of that. Um, and uh, maybe even more so, what concerns me is where we are maybe today, here we are 50 years later, in the state of Mississippi, for the first time, is trying to have a voter ID law in which now, in order to participate and utilize your franchise, you're going to have to have some kind of photo ID. And that's very ironic that that is going to take place this year. It, it, is, it, is, it is really kind of scary when you look at it with, with, in the totality of everything that people from your generation, everything people fought for, uh, people died, um, people were committed to try and help to profoundly change this, this state. Uh, and they looked at the franchise as one of the key components of illustrating that you are, in fact, a citizen. Uh, and now we're kind of weakening people's, uh, people's right to be able to do that, I, I think. So that's, that's heavy. Yeah, we had a program about that very thing here a couple of months ago. Um, by, the, by, say, June of 1964, the Civil Rights Act of 64 was rolling toward passage. But my sense is that uh, the events that took place here during Freedom Summer certainly had impact for the Voting Rights Act of 65. And a lot of people say the, the uh, attack on, uh, on the uh, march at Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma was pivotal. But I think it, it, uh, so much of the momentum was created here. Uh, do, you, do you agree with that? No, I think so. I think that um, uh, when you look at what took place, particularly in Atlantic City, uh, that was a very embarrassing moment for the United States of America in that you try to work out this compromise. You clearly have a state that is utilizing, and you use a great word, which is apartheid, segregation. Uh, you have individuals that are not able to vote. Here, these individuals now have created their own independent party in which they've tried to have a democratic process that illustrates we're allowing everyone to try to participate. We've had uh, uh, have a mock election. We've got representatives. Uh, we want to be seated at this at this convention. Uh, now the Democratic candidate has got to make some kind of decision. You have Mrs. Hamer, who epitomizes uh, African Americans and their struggle. Here she is, this uneducated sharecropper. Uh, but we can't put her on national TV in prime time. What do we do with Ms. Hamer? Uh, we eventually put her speech later on in the night. Uh, and so all of these things were real embarrassment, not only for, I think, the state of Mississippi, but I think for the federal government. The federal government they had to make a decision that um, we do have this opportunity now to empower individuals in terms of civil rights and voting rights. Uh, and here we are, you know, criticizing what's going on uh, in Germany, criticizing what's going on in Russia. Uh, and we have this idea of democracy, but the reality is it is, uh, it is not really true. And so we must begin to do some things, at least at the federal level, to give the appearance that um, we're very serious about that. So I think you make a very good point. Yeah, and, and one, one other thing I think of with the Freedom Democrats challenge at the Democratic Convention in Atlantic City that year was it, it changed politics in America. Yes. Up until then, you watch these conventions, they're all a bunch of old white guys. Exactly. guys. And the Democrats realized that something was wrong here and they needed to change their ways. And they made a commitment after 64 that that, that, wouldn't, ha that wouldn't happen again in their party. Right. And uh, the, the Democrats began assuring that you would, every state's delegation would reflect the population, whether it's color, gender, whatever. And uh, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's gone from there, all because of, of Freedom Democrats. And you were, you were there, Roy. Right, that's right. And Guillot, 
uh, God bless his soul, who passed away about a year or so ago, uh, Clarence Horner, who is a friend of mine, who is an archivist and a historian at, at uh, Tougaloo College, is doing a is collecting all of his papers and collecting all of the videos that's been done on Lawrence Guyot. Yeah. And it's going to be some stuff on him because he was a prime mover. In yeah, that, he, and, uh, and he couldn't go to Atlantic Parliament. City because he was in jail down that's right. here. He couldn't go to Atlantic City because he was in jail. That is correct. Uh, yeah, Lawrence Guyot was a great guy. Right. And we also had, had a program with him here, God rest his soul, uh, 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 the, the week we had the presidential debate. We right. thought that would be a. Right. Good to time Charles's ago. point earlier about Mrs. Hamer, being that sharecropper from the Delta, that uh, lack of quote-unquote educated woman. Uh, but the major reason why they didn't want to come on, because Johnson didn't want to be embarrassed, as you, right. as you alluded to, and uh, it came up with this idea of having this fake press conference, <laughs> uh, because Hamer was being so powerful at that credential committee. Yeah. People saw it later, and it still had an impact. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it was that's riveting, right. that, that testimony. Yeah, was, they took her off the air live to, absolutely. to go to the LBJ, absolutely. but she was so powerful that exactly. they... Ran the a shell crop from Mississippi gets the president to uh, to pull off the air. And yeah. that, that tells you kind of power at the grassroots level that mm -hmm. that woman had. Yeah, there's a, another thing that occurs to me that summer, and you referred to COFO, right. Council of Federated Organizations. It was an alliance of four civil rights groups that had squabbled down through, uh, well, some of them were fairly new, like SNCC, but they'd never really gotten along. You had the, uh, the kind of very establishment uh, NAACP. Then you had CORE, Congress of Racial Equality. Then you had uh, Dr. King's SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And uh, then the Young Turks group, SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And for one shining moment, they, they all came together for Freedom Summer. And uh, sh shortly thereafter, uh, it all blew up, uh, but they accomplished a, a, a great purpose. That's right. Uh, that summer. Absolutely. Um, we, we talked about in the Shelby County, and I want to get back to that because um, um, it, it, most people know about it, even if you weren't around through the movie Mississippi Burning, and. Uh, uh, a lot of people had problems with, with some aspects of that movie, but I felt that Alan Parker, the director, really captured uh, the fear that existed that summer. Uh, Roy, I, I, you were there. Tell well, us the about fear, the fear. I think fear. one of the things, that, and I just wrote a note here about the greatest psychological change during the last 50 years has been the loss of fear by African Americans and the liberation of whites from the closed society. I think if we look back 50 years, uh, we, we tend to kind of how can I say, minimize the, the power that fear had both over black people and white people. White people, good white people, were reluctant to move because they felt intimidated by uh, the other half, and black people, of course, because of the real fear of, of violence and intimidation. Uh, so the, the fact that that movement that summer uh, freed that up as we move away from that mm -hmm. and also liberated white people was, again, the kind of impact that that movement had on the entire country. Yeah. Um, you know, a personal story, I was a young reporter in Clarksdale that summer. The first arrest made in 64 after the passage of the uh, Civil Rights Act were uh, two or three guys from Greenwood who had been arrested for beating up a young black guy who had tried to go to the theater in Greenwood, and they brought him to Clarksdale, which was a federal jail. And I got a call from uh, Associated Press saying, uh, if you get us a picture of, uh, of these guys, uh, you know, you'll get $10, $10 was big money back then. So I grabbed the camera and I go down to the county jail. Ordinarily, I would know everybody there. I knew the jailer, knew the sheriff. But they were gone. And the jail had been taken over by the Klan from Greenwood. And they said to me, you know, what you want, boy? And I said, well, I thought uh, Mr. Belk uh, might like to have his picture taken, Mr. Belk being one of the guys in jail. And they said, Mr. Belk don't want his picture took. And I was not exactly a profile in courage. So <laughs> I, 
I'd, I'd departed. Uh, so it, it, wasn't, it wasn't just people of color who were terrorized and frightened that summer. I mean, white people were also, uh, mm -hmm. also yeah. frightened. And I must say also my parents, you know, who were, uh, had, had not at that time registered to vote, because I think I ended up registering before they did. I think my father finally got registered about 66 or so. My mother maybe 66 or 67. But the, 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 this, this notion of, of fear, I mean, they obviously had real concerns about my being involved yeah. at such a young age. And, you know, you give an example of the kind of hate even. We were, we were demonstrating in Hollis Springs in front of a big star store. And this guy with this pickup truck, and we had sort of stepped out into the street, and I could just see the fear in his eyes. But he also had hate in his eyes as, as we walked along the street, because his, his, his aim was to run me over. And uh, just luckily, I was able to step back over on the, on the sidewalk to avoid the, the truck. Uh, another instance, we went to a theater in Hollis Springs. Of course, that eventually closed down. Uh, they had a, one theater there, a uh, black set uh, upstairs. We call it the Monkey Gallery. And the whites sat down, and of course, that was always kind of dangerous, because sometimes the black kids would throw popcorn down on the first floor. And maybe but, things uh, yeah, harder than but, popcorn. But, <laughs> yeah, but the, but the point is, we decided that we didn't like that. So we, we decided to, to, uh, to, to integrate. And of course, um, uh, one of the chefs there, who turns out to be a pretty moderate guy, didn't beat us up, but he did arrest us, uh, took us to jail. But right after that, uh, rather than the theater owner, who was named Leon Roundtree, a Jewish fellow, by the way, uh, decided rather than deal with the kind of repercussion he was going to get from integrating the theater, he closed it down. So Holly Springs to this day uh, does not have a theater. They're not missing a thing. Joe? Uh, so <laughs> uh, when, you look at, when you look at actually what took place in terms of uh, in, in, in the Shelby County, um, as a historian, I, the way I, I think in, you would like to remember it or look at it in terms of its impact is that you know, prior to that incident, you had a, a significant number of African Americans that had been killed, uh, whether it be right. George Lee, whether it be uh, Emmett Till, whether it be Mac Parker, um, even someone as profound as uh, Megar Evers is, is assassinated in 1963, and they had a couple of trials, and, and, and nothing happened in those trials uh, in terms of a conviction. And so, when the three civil rights workers, and particularly the two young men that were white that were killed, the federal government now becomes uh, more involved and even actually prosecute. So there's no prosecution by the federal government for individuals that killed Emmett Till or any other of these other individuals before that. But now the federal government becomes very, very active, very, very strong. And from that point on, you really begin to see a kind of decline in this kind of violence that was taking place uh, in, in, in the state of Mississippi. Uh, and it takes uh, really uh, again, Megar Evers uh, and Mrs. Evers in 1994, trying to bring Bella, Della Beckwith back uh, and, and retrying and eventually getting him convicted that you have he Philadelphia, he's the first one, and that now you begin to have the other individuals uh, eventually uh, being being brought brought to justice. And of course, Edgar Ray Killen is the only one that's ever been convicted by the state of Mississippi that was actually involved in that abduction and, and that. And that's that, true. And, and that the and the others are known. Right. Um, they were certainly brought before the yes. grand jury. Yes. Um, Kudos to Jared Mitchell, too, a depressed, here's a press mm -hmm. man, uh, who who has been a reporter, as you know, for the Clarence Ledger in Jackson for a number of years. He's done a wonderful job. He has. Uh, matter of fact, he just recently uncovered some stuff going on with the University of Mississippi with respect to those people who was buried there, you know, that used to be associated with the old, what they used to call the insane asylum there in Jackson. Right, right. He broke that story. But Jared Mitchell has been doing great work for a number of years, and, and he has to get a lot of credit for yeah, what Jared, he's done. Jared was, uh, was very much responsible for getting the prosecution cranked up against DeLay Beckwith who murdered Medgar Evers. Um, He's, he's, uh, we're, we're proud of Jerry. Um, Local. Susan, one other thing about uh, Mississippi Burning, because I think so many people have seen that. How many people saw that movie, Mississippi Burning? Like virtually it. everybody <laughs> saw it. Uh, Susan, there, there were a lot of uh, people who had reservations about it, and I'm sure you can address that. Would you just share that? I think a lot of people may not know that there were a lot of objections Absolutely. Over that movie. Um, the the main 
uh, controversy uh, is that it makes the federal government look mm -hmm. very heroic, uh, sort of riding in on their white steeds uh, to save folks. And of course, that's not what happened. In fact, it took very strategic uh, efforts by uh, SNCC and, and COFO to sort of lure right them, to, to compel them to come. Uh, sadly, it even took deaths, uh, especially of these two white uh, gentlemen. I mean, they didn't. They, they, when they were looking for the bodies, uh, they were looking for the three civil rights workers. And, and pretty much by the second day that they were gone, we knew that we were looking. They were looking for bodies. They found nine other uh, African American bodies that that no one had done anything about. Right. Right. So so the federal government did not care until it was white bodies that died. And so for the for the film to make it look as if the federal government was this wonderful heroic entity that came in to, to do the right thing um, it, it, it is, is historically inaccurate. Um, and it, and it, um, it, it undercuts the power of grassroots activism, which is actually what made the change uh, occur. Yeah, I think one other thing from a white guy's perspective is that probably starting with Megar Evers murder, but then that you know, terrible church bombing in Birmingham in the fall of 63, and then on top of that, uh, about a year after McGrevers was killed, uh, the, the, the murders in Neshoba County, that, that there were so many white people uh, who recoiled from this and said, you know, my God, do we want to live in a society that's going to uh, accept that? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, unfortunately, it took the deaths of some very good people mm -hmm. to do to do that, but it brought a lot of white Mississippians to their senses in terms of well, and the and the movie itself, in fact, though though it's problematic in many ways, uh, it actually did encourage di some beginning of dialogue. It, it took 25 years, right? It came out in '89, uh, I believe, '88, '89. So it was around the 25th anniversary of the murders, but in Philadelphia, it prodded the first sort of beginnings of public conversation because after the murders occurred, there was a silence that swept over that town as surely as a carpet yeah. over the town. And, and children who would leave from Mississippi and tell folks they were from Neshoba County would get this strange look in return and they would have no clue why that was the case. They were not taught uh, this history. There was just this silence. It was a sort of public secret that everyone knew but no one talked about. And it wasn't until the movie that, that, that Stanley Dearman and Dick Maupas and Don Kilgore and others tried to start a conversation and they invited the family members in and they, they offered an apology. There are many people that say that it was that apology that Dick made that then cost him mm -hmm. the gubernatorial election when he ran later. Um, but it then still took 40 years yeah. for some new leaders to come together and say, we've got to do something about this case. We've got to call for justice. And I think that's an excellent point because that's a testament to the amount of fear when you Absolutely. you have individuals, Alton Wayne Roberts was a trigger man that shot the two young men. Uh, and James Cheney was shot by another individual. Uh, they're buried on Olin Burge's property at this dam. Everybody, everybody knows these people. They're walking around town. It's like, Dots on Street, right. right? So it's like, you know. But the state of Mississippi never brought charges against those individuals, and they had federal charges that were brought against them, and they they served a little time. But uh, still, the fact of the matter is, is that they live late 1960s, 1970s. Alden Wayne Roberts dies in a freak accident by falling off some kind of a lift, but um, never prosecuted by the, by the state of Mississippi. And so the amount of fear and maybe even the embarrassment, and I think, uh, you know, kudos to uh, what you were able to accomplish to have these individuals to come and talk to each other is, is, is a testament to um, a certain amount of strategy. I don't know what you use, how to do that, because clearly this was a town that has some deep, dark secrets, but this stuff was really, you could see it, you could touch it, you could hear it, but it was almost like they just they didn't acknowledge it, which is, which is, which is pretty heavy. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the night after the, the call for justice in 2004, we, um, the community group gathered together, uh, had a potluck, of course, because you can't get together if you don't have some good food, and, and, we, and we asked people, okay, you know, we've gotten to this place, 
where you, the first benchmark that you've identified as a group, you know, what do you want to do? You know, um, we're, we're not about imposing any agenda on anybody. What, where do you want to go from, from here? And to a person, they, they, they said, we want to turn toward education. We want to um, continue to make our communities better. They, and they started to do really phenomenal things like changing the way that monies were spent um, that generally had been decided by a small group of, of powerful whites in the community. They began to make decisions together about how monies were going to be spent for parks and that sort of thing. Um, but, but I saw um, a gentleman who stood up. He was a bank president, white guy. And he'd hardly really ever spoken in the meetings. Um, and the, night, the next night after the call for justice, he stood up and he was shaking. And he said, yesterday, I got to go to tell David Goodman that I was so sorry for what my town did to his brother. And David Goodman stopped me and said, you don't owe me an apology. I'm so, our family's so proud of the leadership that you're displaying. And Guy Nowell said, I'm 50 years old and this is the first time I felt proud to be from Neshoba County. I mean, and that, is a, that is just a powerful uh, indicator of, of uh, how the fear, the silence, uh, the apathy, the, all the things that got, that got rolled up and the process that it took to get to that uh, moment. Thank you. Questions? Anybody got questions? Warren? Yes, well, just to clarify, the, the federal charges were not murder charges. That's they right. Were for failure Correct. Violate, violate civil, civil rights. rights. Correct. Absolutely. Correct. That's right. Exactly right. That's correct. Absolutely. That's an important point. Well, with respect to the FBI again, uh, and I don't like the, I like the movie too much, but I do think you're right in terms of, <laughs> of, of at least starting some conversation about it, was the fact that even in my experience in the 60s, the FBI agents in Hollis Springs, what the FBI agents did, they observed and took notes. So if bombings occurred or fires occurred, they did absolutely nothing. Now, I'm not saying it was their responsibility perhaps to do that. I'm just saying what they did. They stood by and took notes. Yeah, I remember third. as a journalist talking to them, and they would say, we're not here to protect anybody. We're here to investigate. Uh, <laughs> they made that very clear. Yes. Wow. Questions? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, I'm actually a native of Meridian, um, and, you know, just going around down there, no markings or monuments or anything, really. I, I didn't even know there was a court office in, in Meridian at the time until you passed on. Yep. So I think one of the thing, places you can start is I think Meridian just elected his first African American mayor, uh, which in itself is an, a, a testament to how far it's come. I, I've looked at some statistics. I think Meridian has dramatically increased in terms of inside the city limits. It is probably uh, more African American than it is white. Many of the uh, whites that are in maybe Lauderdale County do not live inside the city limits of Meridian itself. Meridian is a very, very interesting interesting town from the perspective that um, uh, it's, it's, it's relatively, I think, kind of s divided in terms of those individuals that have a lot of money and then you have a lot of African Americans that are coming from some very challenged social economic uh, situations. To answer your question, I think that um, the information is there because the individuals that were involved in the Ku Klux Klan, many of them were from Meridian. Uh, and um, so the, the city of Meridian could easily put up markers Again, I think Susan could attest to this, that there is probably a significant amount of embarrassment in terms of people are still around that have relatives that may be directly involved. How do you work through those feelings and emotions in terms of responsibility and how people are going to judge uh, this particular city and maybe the role, in fact, that it played in this, in this, kind, of, in this kind of crime? The, the folks in Neshoba County actually uh, made overtures to the folks in Lauderdale County sure. 10 years ago to see if they wanted to participate in uh, the efforts that were, on, that were ongoing. And, and there was, there was uh, nervousness, uh, anxiety about, about lifting up those issues. That, some of that has changed now. Um, and uh, there, there are supposed to be efforts uh, uh, this summer to commemorate Freedom Summer in Meridian. 
I'm, I'm going to yield the floor to Roy here because he's got something he wants oh, to talk yeah, I just, about. Just, but just, okay. I, I, before okay. I do that, that's a good way to wind it up. But I just want to say one other thing that uh, while we've been beating up on the Shelbo County and uh, adjacent Meridian, uh, whatever, I don't want to neglect my home county of Pike County. <laughs> Uh, in 64, it became known as the church burning capital of the world. It was a stronghold yep. of the Ku Klux Klan. And at least 25 African-American churches that had uh, voter registration drives uh, going on or civil rights rallies were either uh, dynamited, blown up, or burned to the ground in, uh, in my home county, Pike County. And it, happily, things are much better there a number of African Americans uh, uh, hold major uh, political offices. Well, and along with Benton County, uh, Macomb is one of the models of civil rights education. That's um, right, and, and I'm glad Curtis mentioned Macomb because Macomb was also ground zero for Bob Moses. Yeah. Yep. So it was no accident he decided to go to Macomb, knowing that it was a tough place. If you, if you could sort of crack the nut, which he didn't initially, yeah. in Macomb you could crack it anywhere. So obviously yeah. ground zero. Yeah, it, it just. Uh, you know, uh, Two or three people I would like to just mention who were here for Freedom Summer, whose you know, names will be familiar to you. And, and uh, we've already heard about uh, Stoker Carmichael and Bob Moses. Uh, Barney Frank, remember the very funny congressman from uh, Massachusetts involved in all the most recently uh, banking uh, stuff in Congress. Barney uh, was uh, 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 involved with Freedom Summer in, um, in Jackson, and then Tom Hayden, a very radical student, uh, one of the heads of student, uh, Students for Democratic Society, SDS, later married Jane Fonda, uh, he but he was very active, uh, active uh, state legislator. Uh, I know uh, uh, Tom worked down in Macomb. Um, Roy, tell us about what's oh, coming I up. I think the question was about Meridian, but this is, uh, just wanted to point out that there's going to be uh, a conference in June, yes. 25th through the 29th, this, this 2014, in Jackson. Uh, most of the events going to take place at Tougaloo College, and this is going to be 50 years uh, later, but it's going to be more than just a discussion of 6 to 4. It's going to be something that Charles mentioned as well, where we go from here, and it's going to be a focus on, mm -hmm. on uh, education, being sort of the nature of a race. It's going to be a focus on on voting rights, you know, talked about the barriers that, that the state has just passed with respect to voter ID. That's going to be discussed. The, the union organizing in Mississippi just passed, I think, some legislation that uh, sets up more anti-union activity. Uh, that's going to be a focus. So the, as I said earlier, young people made the movement in the 60s, and I would assume that there are still issues that young people will face today and in the future. So there may be a different set of issues. They may be more complicated. They may be more nuanced, as you said earlier, but they're out there. And so this, this uh, summer, for four days or so, let me invite, and we got some uh, brochures here, uh, let me invite you to attend that conference. There will be people there from all over the country and all over the world. It'll be a chance to, for people to see how far Mississippi has come. I said to Wilkie earlier, Ben, that this is my home. I love this state. Uh, I came back. Uh, I leave and I come back, and of course I travel the world. And I, you know, you always Mississippi. Always, well, I don't know whether because people say it's the first word I learned to spell Mississippi. Um, but the fact of the matter is, uh, the movement that started here uh, went to the war movement, went to the women movement, went to the gay movement, went to the, anywhere in the world you go, yes. people have heard of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. They have heard of Freedom Summer. And they heard of this wonderful movement that changed not only Mississippi, but the whole world. And so that I'm really proud of, yeah. uh, being a participant, but also still being a uh, citizen of this, of this state. Good. Roy, thank you so much. Thank Susan, you. thank you. Chuck, thank you. Thank you all for coming.